Welcome to the CDA Institute's Expert Series, the podcast that brings you in-depth conversations with the brightest minds in defense, security, foreign policy, and international relations. Each week, we delve into the most pressing issues facing our world today. A U.S. criminal indictment recently revealed an alleged plot connected to the Indian government to carry out multiple assassinations in North America. The indictment accuses Indian national Nikhil Gupta of attempting to arrange a killing in New York linked to a case that strained Canada-India relations. The targets included Sikh separatist activists, sparking concerns about potential implications for India's Sikh minority and prompting high-level inquiries from the Indian government. Joining us to discuss these recent assassination allegations and their consequences for U.S.-India relations, India's standing in geopolitics, Indian foreign policy, and Indo-Pacific security, we have Lisa Curtis and Sumit Ganguly. This is the Expert Series. First, we'll turn to Lisa Curtis, Senior Fellow and Director for the Indo-Pacific Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. She'll discuss the geopolitical implications of the assassination allegations against India, U.S.-India relations, as well as conflict resolution mechanisms. Lisa, thanks for joining us today. Great to have you on. Could you provide insights into the assassination allegations against India and shed light on the alleged motivations behind the plot? Additionally, I'm interested in understanding how India perceives the activities of pro khalistan leaders and whether it considers them as a threat to its sovereignty. Yeah, to start with, uh, a U.S. indictment was released by the Department of Justice just last week, which indicated that um, U.S. uh, FBI agents were tracking an assassination plot against a dual U.S. Canadian citizen, um, uh, Mr. Panoon, who is uh, right now located in New York. And they, uh, the indictment indicated that the individual who was directing the assassination plot was in touch with an Indian government official in India. So these are really explosive allegations. And they gave some credence to allegations that Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau made in September on the floor of the Canadian Parliament uh, about uh, potential Indian government involvement in an assassination that was actually carried out against a Sikh activist in Canada in June. So uh, these are are very um, serious uh, allegations. And unlike when uh, Prime Minister Trudeau levied his allegations and the Indians reacted very badly and very vocally against those allegations and even went to the extent of expelling Canadian diplomats from India, uh, India has actually taken the U.S. allegations, this U.S. indictment that was released very seriously, and they are investigating. All accounts indicate that they are seriously investigating the charges. So the reason that India, uh, you know, is potentially, uh, we have to say, you know, allegedly um, carrying out these assassination plots um, is that India believes uh, the Sikh activists are inciting people to violence inside India. Um, They claim that these leaders have been involved in actual terrorist plots inside India. And, you know, it is true that there was a Khalistan movement, a movement for a a free, uh, independent um, Punjab in in India uh, that was very active in the 80s and 90s. And there were acts of Sikh terrorism, for instance, the... Uh, Prime Minister of India, Indira Gandhi, was assassinated in in 1984, shortly after there had been an Indian military raid on a, a major Sikh temple in in India. So, you know, there there have been uh, Sikh uh, incidents of Sikh terrorism in the past. However, um, you know, I don't think that U.S. and Canadian officials have information on these individuals that India is now targeting as being involved in actual acts of terrorism or terrorism plots. Could you provide more insight into the evolving importance of the U.S.-India relationship and the key factors driving India's increasing influence on the global stage? India-U.S. relations have really been um, growing and uh, becoming much more, uh, you know, uh, consequential to the region and, and really the globe. Uh, really over the last 20 years. 
uh, the support for building U.S. India ties is bipartisan. Both Democratic and Republican administrations over the last 20 years have put a great deal of effort into expanding that relationship. President Biden has even said that he believes <clears throat> that he believes the U.S. India relationship is the most important relationship for the United States. I'm not sure I would agree with that, but but this is what you know he has been on record uh, saying. So clearly, you know uh, the U.S. wants to pull out all stops, and we have seen efforts to to enhance that relationship. Just this past summer, when Prime Minister Modi was in Washington, the U.S. announced that it would co-produce jet engine technology with India. This is, um, you know. Uh, capabilities that only a handful of countries have. China doesn't even have that capability. So this shows the extent to which the U.S. is willing to go to build that relationship, build that trust, build that confidence. So that's why the assassination plot and you know revelations of it have been so shocking, I think, for U.S. officials. And, and there has been such a, a, a strong effort to uh, be able to, um, you know, kind of rope those off, deal with those, but not allow them to upend this tremendous progress that the U.S. has painstakingly made with India over the last 20 years. Lisa, I'm interested in what India's response to allegations from both Canada and the United States might reveal about its role in contemporary geopolitics. Well, look, India is clearly an emerging power. Its economy is growing. It's playing a larger role in geopolitics generally. It's a member of the Quad, which has become, you know, a, a critical part of the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific strategy. And I should also point out, India has soft power advantages. Unlike China, India is non-hegemonic. Um, and most countries in the region, in Southeast Asia, for example, want India to play a larger role in the region. They want to offset uh, China's growing assertiveness and military aggression in the region. However, I think what this assassination plot does is it adds to concerns that have been sort of lingering out there for a while, that the Modi government is straying further and further away from India's democratic foundations. And I think the concerns about the assassination plot uh, is similar to concerns that have been expressed about eroding press freedom in India and the Modi government's Hindu nationalist agenda, which often, frankly, results in um, violations of the rights of religious minorities, including mostly Muslims and Christians, uh, but of course, Sikhs would argue their uh, rights are also being disrespected. Um, so this assassination plot, I think, may be a signal that the international community needs to continue to hold Indian leaders to account, uh, particularly on democracy issues, and in this case, rule of law. Uh, Indian leaders should not feel so emboldened or feel that they are so indispensable to the United States that Washington would turn a blind eye to the Modi government acting in increasingly problematic ways uh, when it comes to democracy and rule of law. So I think that that seems to be one lesson uh, that we're seeing with the assassination plots. Do you anticipate that the manner in which the situation is handled could potentially influence the ongoing collaborative efforts between India and the United States to counterbalance China, specifically in the Indo-Pacific region? Well, I think both the United States and India would like to overcome this issue. Uh, the stakes are very high for the India-U.S. relationship. Both countries are concerned about China, and they know they need each other to deal or manage um, China's rise and its increasingly aggressive and assertive behavior. So I think, you know, so long as India takes this uh, these allegations seriously, um, investigates them, takes some action against any individuals found to be involved in the plot, then I think that India and the United States can ultimately 
weather this, um, you know, uh, troubling period in their relationship. Um, I think, you know, even though the U.S. had known about this assassination plot um, going back to, I think, you know, U.S. policymakers were made aware in uh, July, we see that President Biden still went to India for the G20 summit. Uh, We saw that Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin still went to India in November for the two plus two talks. So clearly, the Biden administration wants to sort of compartmentalize this um, issue from the rest of the strategic relationship to the extent that it can. But again, I would say if, if India does not take the allegation seriously and cannot provide some kind of reassurances that this would never happen again, then I think there would be longer term problems for the U.S.-India relationship. Lisa, I'm wondering about the conflict resolution mechanisms that could be explored to address differences between Canada and India, as well as between the U.S. and India. Additionally, how can diplomatic efforts be fostered to prevent further escalation in the situation? Well, I think uh, one thing the United States and Canada uh, can do is demonstrate that they are monitoring closely the Sikh activists, that they will strictly enforce speech laws so that Sikh activists um, are careful when they speak on social media, that they are not inciting people to violence, uh, that they are not advocating terrorism. You know, the uh, a video that was circulating when I was in India recently was this video of uh, Panun, who was the uh, the person who the assassination plot was against. And of course, this was before the U.S. indictment. This was in early November. Uh, the video showed Panun talking about, um, you know, how Sikhs should not fly on Indian airliners, you know, after November 20th. Um, and Indians were, you know, complaining that this was threatening terrorism, that he was threatening a terrorist plot on Indian airlines. Um, and of course, Panun says that he was uh, advocating for a boycott of Indian airlines. Now, I don't speak fluent Punjabi, so I, I don't know exactly what was said, but this gives you an idea of Indian perceptions of what the Sikh activists are doing and what the Sikh activists you know, say they are doing. So there, there's a big gap there. And I think, you know, the the ironic thing is that, you know, uh, the FBI had probably increased its attention to seek leaders like Panoon uh, to enforce the rule of law in the United States. They were probably monitoring his activities. But because of this increased attention to seek activities in the United States, that's probably what led them to be able to uncover the Indian plot to assassinate Sikh leaders. So it really is incredible if you think about it. And and it shows, um, you know, the the major gap between the countries on this issue. Um, But it also shows that India needs to understand um, the rule of law, you know, in Canada and the United States, and that the U.S. and Canada will uphold the rule of law and that it's absolutely outrageous uh, for a country to think that it can assassinate uh, another country's citizen on its uh, another country's territory. Uh, this is something that, that absolutely um, India needs to understand uh, would not be acceptable to any democracy. Lisa, thanks for your analysis today. Next, we'll turn to Dr. Sumit Ganguly, Rabindranath Tagore Chair in Indian Cultures and Civilizations at Indiana University. Sumit will discuss how the handling of the ongoing diplomatic situation may affect efforts to counterbalance China, India's domestic challenges related to secularism, and the need for a coherent strategy in dealing with neighbors for long-term stability and growth. Sumit, it's so nice to have you on. Thank you for joining the CDA Institute today. To initiate, Dr. Ganguly, let's explore how the ongoing diplomatic situation might influence the collaborative efforts of India and the United States in counterbalancing China, particularly within the Indo-Pacific. This is almost invariably going to cause some level of friction in Indo-US relations, because if there is even a shred of truth 
to this allegation that Indian authorities were involved in trying to kill uh, Gurpatwan Singh Panun, uh, this Sikh activist in New York City, then it would be a fairly brazen act. Um, at this point, all we know is that there certain indictments have been issued, uh, but beyond that, we don't know very much more about this subject. But even on the basis of the indictments, uh, uh, and also that um, uh, people from the National Security Council in the United States have traveled to India. William Burns, the director of the CIA, has traveled to India with concerns about this matter, suggests that already there is a, a degree of concern, if not actual tension in the relationship. India has experienced quite substantial economic growth over the last couple of decades, um, on some occasions almost uh, breaching uh, two digits, um, and the growth for the most part has been sustained uh, despite a global recession in uh, uh, 2008 and despite the ravages that the pandemic exacted on economic growth across the world, India has managed to bounce back. And as a consequence of this economic growth, India's significance in global affairs has dramatically increased, um, unlike in the past when uh, India uh, talked a good line, but really didn't have the material capabilities to back up uh, those kinds of claims um, and uh, attempts at improving its uh, global standing. Um, uh, so also, India is now a major um, uh, arms purchaser across the world, uh, running into the billions of dollars, and consequently, major bars are interested in selling uh, weaponry to India, especially as it uh, weans itself off from its dependence on Russia. Um, um, uh, and um, uh, the United States in particular sees India as a potential counterweight to the rise and the growing aggressiveness of the People's Republic of China in Asia and sees India as a potential strategic partner and bulwark uh, strategic bulwark against uh, the PRC. Could you compare the response from India to Canada and the United States regarding the respective allegations? In considerable part, um, uh, uh, India, I think, values its relationship with the United States far more uh, than its relationship with Canada. Obviously, it has a longstanding relationship with Canada going back uh, to the times of Lester Pearson, the noted Canadian Prime Minister and his relationship with Prime Minister Nehru, um, the range of people-to-people -people, uh, contacts. Uh, there was the possibility of a major trade breakthrough uh, with Canada. But uh, to be quite candid, it pales into insignificance when compared to the relationship with the United States, which is not only multifaceted, but um, uh, strategic and um, uh, economically, in terms of economics, far more robust. Um, and um, uh, the, the, contact, the relationship is much more intertwined. And consequently, the costs of alienating the United States are substantially higher. Much depends on how the Indians handle this. Uh, it, but they certainly cannot afford to be as cavalier as they have been uh, in terms of dealing with the allegation of the killing of uh, this other activist in Surrey outside uh, Vancouver. Um, uh, and in fact, one has already noticed that India's reaction to 
uh, the two cases has been markedly different. The um, uh, spokesperson of the Indian uh, Foreign Ministry, Arindam Bhagji, uh, issued a fairly anodyne and inoffensive statement when uh, pressed on the issue of India's likely or possible involvement in the attempt to kill uh, this other Sikh activist in New York City. Um, you notice the stark contrast in the difference um, uh, in the the stark contrast in the two public reactions to Canada and to the United States. To what extent do the historical concerns about Sikh separatists operating in Western countries contribute to India's perspective on this matter? Does it impact India's national security considerations at all? Certainly, the Indians have been concerned for a long time about uh, Sikh activists and Sikh separatists, whether in the United Kingdom, in the United States, or in Canada. And the Indians were also quite disappointed with uh, the failure of Canadian investigative authorities uh, and uh, to prosecute the um, uh, individuals who were responsible for blowing up an Air India airliner uh, in the 1980s, the Emperor Kanishka um, uh, off uh, 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 the coast of, um, um, uh, of uh, Ireland. Uh, and that still rankles in Indian policymaking circles. And there's a sense in India that uh, Canadian authorities, particularly under Justin Trudeau, have not been adequately sensitive to Indian concerns about the presence of Sikh separatists and their activities in Canada. Finally, Dr. Ganguly, what would you say are some major challenges or opportunities you see for India as it continues to become a more significant, more crucial player in the global geopolitical landscape? India has been a somewhat reluctant partner in the Quadrilateral Security Initiative, popularly referred to as the Quad, which involves the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. And um, uh, partly because India faces a substantial security threat from China, and one would think that given that it faces that security threat, it would be a more forthcoming partner in the Quad. But ironically, because India it feels uncertain that the other Quad members would readily rally to India's cause um, uh, to uh, and address India's security threat from China, um, India has been a somewhat reluctant partner. Uh, and yet it knows that on its own, it cannot cope with the, the threat from China. But the reluctance stems from the fact that too close an association in the Quad could actually invoke the ire of the Chinese uh, even further. And that's why India has played this delicate balancing act on the one hand, participating in the Quad, but shying away from fully embracing the security implications of the Quad. The principal challenge that it faces is the security threat from China, and it cannot cope with that threat entirely on its own. And so it needs to make a decision about what is its long-term strategy for coping with this threat, because diplomatic initiatives with the PRC certainly have not worked out. So if diplomacy is not a solution, and if you do not have the requisite domestic capabilities, what then do you do to cope with this long-term threat? And this is one of the principal challenges that India confronts. In addition to this external challenge, domestically, it faces other challenges. One is about what kind of country does it want to be? The current government seems intent on undermining India's commitment uh, to secularism, which was 
shaky even earlier under previous governments, but the present government has launched a full-scale assault on this. And in my judgment, this is a fundamentally flawed set of policies because it is likely to foment significant domestic discord. You cannot marginalize close to 200 million uh, members of your own uh, population of your citizenry who are who are Muslims. Uh, that is not a recipe for um, uh, societal stability. And this is something that the present government really needs to reconsider uh, because uh, India's long-term uh, prospects of social stability and economic growth could be severely affected by this. Third, I would argue that India uh, needs to uh, develop a coherent strategy for dealing with its neighbors on a long-term basis, reassuring them that India does not harbor any hostile intent. Of course, the key stumbling block remains Pakistan because multiple attempts at reassuring Pakistan uh, have not worked. Pakistan is a revisionist power. Uh, unhappy with the status quo in South Asia. So maintaining at least some semblance of a uh, normal relationship is the best that India can hope for uh, with Pakistan, given that Pakistan remains intransigent over the status of the disputed territory of Kashmir. But with the other smaller regional states, um, India can afford to be a more generous um, uh, partner, uh, given its sheer size and its uh, economic, military and diplomatic uh, capabilities. And that would go a long ways to uh, promote growth and stability in the region. Dr. Ganguly, thank you for joining me today. Great discussion. That's all for this week's episode of the CDA Institute Expert Series. To learn more about the CDA Institute, you can visit our website at cdainstitute.ca or subscribe to our newsletter. Thanks, and we hope you'll be joining us next week.